I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19 is where we're going to be today. If you don't have a Bible with you, that is fine. Grab one of the ones in the pews that look just like this. Turn to page 1116 and you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible and you need a Bible, then please take one of those. We want you to have the Word of God and to be able to read the Word of God because we know if you do that, it will change your life. Hey, uh, last couple of weeks we've been talking about the Sweetwater Worship Center and the project there. And I just want you guys to know that uh, as we shared a few weeks ago, we needed about $238,000 to uh, finish the building the way that it was uh, originally designed and intended. And uh, as of uh, the end of this week, we had 112 families who had made commitments uh, totaling about $350,000 in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah. So praising God because he provides and thanking you for your generosity and your commitment to Calvary and the work that God is doing here. Hey, uh, how many of you guys like chocolate? Oh, a lot of you do. Okay. Do you guys like the, the fancy chocolate or the, like the cheap chocolate better? Okay, some of you are, uh, I don't want to start a fight or anything, but I do want to give out some chocolate this morning, uh, and, uh, but I've got the fancy kind, and because, uh, you know, that box of chocolates, if you don't have the little cheater list on the lid, you don't really know what you're going to get, and uh, so, uh, so, so who wants some chocolate? Uh, oh, okay, so uh, I, I, I told these girls they get to have, uh, to help me out, so go ahead, grab a piece, make it quick, I've got to preach a sermon, and... Uh, <laughs> So now, are you picky? Do you guys, do you, are, you, are you really picky about what, you, what kind of chocolate it is? Okay, good. Try it and see if you like it. Is it any good? Is it what you wanted? Oh, okay. Nobody, no, how about over here? Anybody need, oh, you need chocolate over here? Okay. Come on. You can have some too, Mom. Do you like this stuff? Oh, okay. Yes, you do. Okay. Is it what you want? Go ahead and eat it. Got to tell me if it's any good. Is it what you like? Did you get the right thing? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, she's got caramel. She's like, I'm happy. Okay, what, what, are you reaching out? Are you, like, trying to get some? Oh, you, you need one, too? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm hoping somebody gets something they really don't like. Did you get anything you didn't like? No, you're good? It's okay? You don't like it? It's okay. Because, okay. you know, when you don't like it, did, does anybody else do this when you don't like it, when you pick it out of the candy box, you just kind of go, Bleh. <laughs> Spit it back out? Because... My mom loves chocolate, and so we always had stuff like this when I was growing up, and she would go, do you want a piece of chocolate? And so you go over there, and, and, and you're agonizing, because back in the day, they didn't have those little cheater lists on the inside of the lid that they have now. You know what I'm talking about? You guys remember that? And you look at it, and if you're picky like I am, you're like, oh, golly, which one is going to taste good? And you grab the wrong one, and it's got, you know, cream or cherries in it or something like that, and, and you pop it in there, and you're like, Bleh. I don't like it. Can I have another one? No, because you wasted that one, right? So I didn't like, I don't like, I, you know, stick, I'll stick with the cheap stuff, uh, you know, like we want you guys to bring for Main Street. But uh, I hate those kind of surprises where you get the wrong thing. So today we're beginning a series called The Core, and we want to eliminate the surprises. Uh, we want to inform you what Calvary is all about, our beliefs, our core values, uh, so that you know who we are. Because we don't want you to come here and go, wow, I really like this church. You know, they got great music, preaching's okay, but uh, I'm going to go. And, and, and then you find out down the road that it, we're not your flavor, and you kind of go, bleh. We don't want to do that. So we're just going to be, we're transparent here. We're going to tell you right up front who we are, what we're all about, uh, so that, that we eliminate those surprises. And today we're starting with our very first core value, which is calling. Calling. We are called to lead people to Jesus. This is not optional. Uh, I, I know a lot of you are thinking calling is kind of a churchy word. Uh, people don't use that a whole lot unless they're you know, on the phone. And, uh, but let me tell you how I understand what calling means from a biblical sense. Calling or to be called means that you do what God asks you to do. That's it. God calls us, and we do what God asks us to do. And, and so uh, Abraham was called by God to move, and, and he moved from Ur uh, down to the promised land, but he didn't know where God wanted him to go, so he just you know, was kind of like following God, and God said, I'll tell you when you get there. 
And, uh, and Abraham did that. Moses was called by God to lead the children of Israel out of slavery. And he did that when he was 80 years old. So he was called out of retirement, sort of. Um, you know, Samuel was called to be a prophet when he was just a child. Like these little ones that we dedicated, just a little bit older than that. And, and, and Jesus called Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Uh, as he walked along the Sea of Galilee, he said, Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then God has called you to be involved in his mission of life change. Uh, We know this because Jesus said this was his purpose, his Mission. I want to talk about Jesus' purpose and our purpose. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, is our text today. Is a great story uh, of life change. Now, uh, if you grew up in church, you heard this story a lot, especially like when you were uh, a child. And some of you may even hear a song in your head when we start reading the story. Ignore the song. It kind of distracts from the real message of the story. Now, if you don't hear the song in your head when I'm reading this passage, over lunch, make the person you're with that did hear it sing it for you, okay? <laughs> Just because they, you need the entertainment. So here it goes. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for Jesus was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they grumbled. He is gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of all my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Purpose. Jesus' purpose was to seek and to save the lost. And that's our purpose, our calling. Uh, The way we word that here at Calvary is that Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. That, that's, that's our reason for existing. In fact, this is why we do ministries and why we don't do some things that people want to do as ministry. But it's why we worship the way that we do, because we want to lead people to Jesus. It's why we have Calvary Christian Academy. I mean, it's to provide a great Christian education, but it's also to lead boys and girls and their families to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's why we have Celebrate Recovery. Not just so people can get free from their hurts, habits, and hang-ups, but so they can meet Jesus along the way. That's why we do children's ministry and students' ministry and men's and women's ministries. That's why we want everybody in a life group. Because all of these ministries are connected and support our calling of life change. Our purpose of leading people to Jesus. Every ministry we engage in at Calvary ties in with this purpose. And this is why we're building at Sweetwater. Uh, If if you're new to Calvary, we're under construction. We're about three months out from completing a new worship center over at our new property on Sweetwater Avenue, about a mile and a half from here. Uh, That's that big building that's going up along the highway. And uh, and we're building that uh, to accomplish our purpose. Uh, In other words, uh, like you guys, I anticipate better parking. Anybody with me on that? Yeah. See, the 6 o'clock service last night didn't understand that because, you know, if you come at 6 o'clock on Saturday night, there's great parking. Uh, I anticipate better seating. I know some of you are already starting to agonize about where's my spot going to be in the new sanctuary because it's laid out different than this one. (laughs) 
I love watching that happen in your life as you try to figure out where's my next seat going to be. Uh, I anticipate having better children's space. Uh, you know, that, that whole building is designed for worship and for kids. Uh, but the most thing that I'm excited about and anticipate is the fact that we're going to be able to double in size as a congregation which means that we're going to be able to add to our church more people who experience the power of God to change their lives. That's why when we move, we're going to have four worship services right from the beginning. We'll have one on Saturday and three on Sunday morning, just like we do now. And uh, we're going to do that. People have said to me from being, well, you're going to have go back to two or three worship services? No, because we're not building it for us to be comfortable. We're building it so that we can lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And when we fill up the four services we have, guess what we'll do? We'll add more. We'll add more. Yeah, we'll, we'll do what we have to because this is our calling as a church. And that calling informs our decisions and our priorities. In fact, uh, my conviction is that God doesn't bless churches that ignore his purpose. Uh, sad to say, the statistics tell us that 80 to 90% of churches in America are plateaued or declining. I mean, they're growing the wrong direction. And, and, and having been in a lot of those churches, I, I think one of the reasons is because they put prior, their, their comforts and their preferences ahead of the purpose of God. They don't say that they do that. They just make decisions based on what they want rather than what's going to help people discover Jesus Christ. So at Calvary, we don't just talk about God's purpose and Jesus' mission. We live it. it it's why we shout and clap at baptisms when people declare their life change has happened. It's why we value and invest in children and families' ministries so highly and why they are a priority. Because comfort and preferences are the enemies of purpose. And Jesus has called us to lead people to him. It's not optional. And neither is how we go about fulfilling our purpose. So let's talk about the practice. The practice. How we share Jesus is just as important as that we share Jesus. Did you catch that? How we communicate the good news of Jesus Christ is just as important that we are committed to doing it. Um, I grew up in a traditional evangelical kind of church. Any, anybody with me on that? Anybody grew up in those kind of churches? Okay, I see your hands. Some of you are like, uh, I grew up in those kind of churches. We're not allowed to raise our hands in church. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, the, and the truth is, it was a great upbringing. They introduced me to Christ. They taught me the Bible. Uh, and, and every single church I was in wanted to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They just weren't very good at it. And, uh, and so they taught me, because I love God and I wanted to make a difference as well, they taught me how to do evangelism, how to lead people to Jesus their way. And, uh, and so I've been certified in evangelism explosion, building witnessing relationships, uh, relational evangelism, and a whole bunch of other stuff that really has not made a positive difference in my life. And, and to be quite honest, being certified in all these kinds of ways of leading people to Jesus, I wasn't very good at it. Can I just be honest? I mean, I was in ministry and I was feeling guilty because I wasn't good at leading people to Jesus. It just it did, it wasn't happening the way that I want. I, and I didn't, I didn't like trying to force my, myself on other people and say, okay, here's, here's what you need to do. And the problem is this. There's a lot of people who grew up uh, in churches like, uh, like I did that felt guilty when they were serving God faithfully because they weren't soul winners. By the way, that term soul winner is in the Bible one time. It's in Proverbs, and it has nothing to do with leading people to Jesus. Can I just tell you that? So we don't use that term around here. We, we want you to be involved in leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, but, but how we share is so important. And the problem is, is that the old model was just kind of like yelling at people. And telling them they needed to change. And I don't know about you, but I don't respond really well when people yell at me. Do you guys like it when people yell at you? No. Yeah, except for your husband or wife, right? Because then you're all about that. No, see, we don't even like that. And, and all those things I was certified in to share my faith, you know what they did? They taught me how to politely yell at people. Because they, seriously, because they said, okay, here's, here's how you do it. So you can show up unannounced at somebody's door, knock on their door, interrupt their evening, and then sit down with them and explain to them how they need to change their life based on my convictions. Yeah, you wonder why it didn't work so well, right? And, and, and so uh, here's the thing. 
I don't respond well to that. You don't respond well to that. So let me share with you a couple of guiding principles for how at Calvary we kind of understand leading people to Jesus. A couple of thoughts. First of all, relationship precedes rebuke. Relationship precedes rebuke. We want to know people and love people before we're trying to tell them the truth. Now, you, you got to have the truth. Truth isn't, isn't optional be, because we want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. But those are in order for a reason because I think that our relationship comes first. We want to love people because here's the thing. When people know you and they know that you are for them, they'll listen to you. They'll they'll trust you enough to at least listen, and and they won't be offended if your values are different than their values, and you're sharing why you're so committed to God, why you think Jesus is the answer. They're not going to kick you out of the house. They're not going to get angry. They're they're just going to respect the differences that you have. And, And so we want relationship to precede rebuke. This is why we want you to build relationships with unchurched people. We want you to have friendships with people who don't go to church. Uh, now, again, that's different than how I was raised because being raised in the, the churches I was in, I was told to uh, avoid unchurched people. Stay away from the heathens. Don't you be uh, hanging around those pagans. Those people. Because don't you know the Apostle Paul said, bad company corrupts good morals. And he did say that, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Uh, uh, But there's a problem with that thinking. And the problem is this. uh, We follow Jesus. That's what we call ourselves, right? We're followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, follow me. We follow Jesus. And Jesus set an example that we saw in the story of Zacchaeus about how he related with those people. Jesus hung out with those people, with the heathens, with the pagans, with Zacchaeus. See, we don't think anything about Zacchaeus being a tax collector because we don't understand the context. But in the first century, Zacchaeus basically was an agent for the Romans. He was a traitor to his people, and he was serving the the nation that had conquered them. It'd be kind of like nowadays if somebody was working for ISIS. Seriously, he was the enemy. He was in with the enemy, and the people hated him. That's why you always hear him talk about tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. That was one you know, big group of people that they, they didn't want to have anything to do with. And did you notice that the religious leaders didn't like the fact that Jesus went and hung out with Zacchaeus? Verse 7, it doesn't call them religious leaders. It just says, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. Jesus has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. See, they didn't like the fact that Jesus went and hung out with those people. Um, By the way, I don't know if you realize this or not, but we're the religious people now. (laughs) And if we don't learn from Jesus, we'll be like they were. You see, Jesus went and hung out with those people. Uh, he, he hung out at their parties because he wanted to see life change happen. You, you realize that when Zacchaeus had Jesus come to his house, that he was all excited, so he invited all his friends over. Well, who are his friends? They're tax collectors, they're harlots, they're sinners. They're those people, and there's a whole party full of them. And Jesus is there in the midst, and, and because of the hours that he spent the whole day with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus' life was changed forever. And in the middle of that, that banquet, that dinner, he, he got up and he said, Jesus, God's changed my life, and I'm going to change who I am, and I'm going to start, right now I'm going to give half of everything I own to the poor, and if I've ripped people off, and he had, he was going to pay him back four times what he stole. Isn't that amazing? That's life change that happens right there because Jesus is hanging out with those people. So, as your pastor, I want Calvary to be the church that goes to parties with sinners. Yeah, I want Calvary to be the church that goes to parties with sinners. I know right now some of you are tweeting. And I know that I'm going to be misquoted. So, let me explain. Let me just go ahead and clarify a little bit. I am not encouraging you to get plastered with your unchurched friends. Okay, that is not going to result in leading them to Jesus Christ. 
I am not saying that you should go down to the channel on holiday weekends and wear Calvary pasties and invite people to church. Okay? They're available on the t-shirt table after the service. Okay? No, they're not, all right? For those of you who are literal, we do not have church pasties. So I did. You see, we are to love people who live by different values. Did you hear that? We are to love people who see the world different than we do so that they are drawn to Jesus. In other words, you have to have real relationships with people so you can speak the truth into their lives. Uh, when, when, again, when, when I was growing up, uh, they kept saying, don't hang out with those people. Just live your life in a way that makes them see Jesus. Well, they can't see Jesus when you're living that far away from them. You've got to be up close for them to see how God has changed your life. You've got to have relationships so they see how Christ heals your marriage. You've got to be uh, sharing life with them so they can see that God makes a difference in your family and the way that you do your job. But, but this whole thing only works if you're living out the character of Jesus with them. By the way, if you can't go to the parties with sinners and, and not act like one of them, don't go alone. Take some other Jesus people with you so you have accountability and encouragement. I'm just being honest. That's where Paul counsels us, that bad company can corrupt good morals. Uh, and, and you need to be aware of your weaknesses and, and, and where you are because we're to love people who live differently so that they can meet our Savior and our Lord. Relationship precedes rebuke. And uh, the other guiding principle for us is that we are invitation-oriented. Jesus invited people. What do you say? Follow me. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. He didn't try to manipulate, pressure, or coerce. He, he didn't give long, drawn-out invitations to try and get people to repent. Hey, anybody else hate those, uh, or the, those revival services that lasted forever? Am I the only one in here that did those? Yeah, I told you, we were a really committed family. So we did the week-long revivals where you missed all the TV shows and we didn't have DVRs back in the day. Had to wait six months to see the reruns. It was terrible. But I remember being at those services and you had the evangelist who just wouldn't finish. He, he was trying to manipulate people into coming forward and so we would just sing Just As I Am, you know, 27 verses long. You know, you're on the sixth verse the third time and you're in the back row with your friend going, okay, we'll do rock, paper, scissors and whoever loses has to go forward and repent. Just so we can get this thing over with. You know, and, and it was terrible to think that way, but there's so much manipulation involved. I was at a youth crusade one time where the evangelist might as well have just said, hey, if you want to trust Jesus and have free pizza, come forward. And, and, and it was so sad. Jesus didn't do that. He invited. He loved. He spoke the truth, and people responded. So we just don't go there to that whole manipulation thing. We, we don't want to do coercion. We just want to invite Invite your friends, invite your family, invite your neighbors, because God is at work in their lives. And guess what? Decisions do not have to happen right now. They do not have to happen immediately. We talk about trusting God. We talk about the Holy Spirit drawing people to Jesus. So invite and let the Holy Spirit do his work. By the way, the reason that we serve our community like crazy, doing all the projects and all, all the involvement, is so it's easy for you to invite because you'll say to your friends, hey, you want to go to church with me? And they'll ask you what? What church? And then you say, well, we're Calvary. And they'll go, oh, is that the church that does the Main Street stuff and does the car show and does the school stuff? Yeah, I'll, I'll come with you to that church. That's why we do it. Because we're invitation oriented. Um, finally, I, I want to close with a challenge. You know, we're called by God to lead people to Jesus. And uh, there are about 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City. 40,000 that, that need to connect with the body of Christ, need to know that they can have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. How are we going to do that? Well, let me share with you the plan. Um, I already told you that we're going to be in Sweetwater Worship Center in about three months. I'd love to be in there by Christmas, but 
Uh, you know, they don't make any promises. They just talk about around. But, but we know we'll be in there around Christmas or the first of the year. And, and here's the goal. And we're going to measure this. We want to see 4,000 guests the first six months we're in Sweetwater Worship Center. 4,000 guests. 10% of the unchurched population of Lake Havasu City. Now, of course, we're going to advertise, but that alone is not going to do it. Here's what's going to make that happen. Each of us bring two to three friends to visit at Calvary. That's how it's going to happen. And by the way, when I say bring two to three friends, I'm not talking about two to three friends that go to other churches. I'm talking about two or three friends that are unchurched. Your friends, your family, your neighbor that doesn't go anywhere. That, that has no interest in God. And, and here's the thing. You can, you can invite them by going, hey, look, it's a new building. It's going to be really cool. Why don't you come check it out with me? You know, the community's talking about it, but it boils down to this. Who are the people that you know that need to know God? And are you praying for them? Are you encouraging them? Are you inviting them now? Okay, hey, look, it may take you 100 invites before they say yes. That's okay. Just pace them out so you're not like do it over and over and over again and become annoying. Hey, just, just be persistent. Just go, hey, look, I, I want to keep inviting you. And, and let God work in their life. But if you're not intentional about that, it won't happen. By the way, I, I wrote that down and then I kind of did the, the math. We've averaged 1,335 people at Calvary each weekend this year, which means, hang on. If each of us brings three friends, that adds up to 4,005. Isn't that cool? 10% of the unchurched population, if each one of us simply says, I'm going to bring three people who don't go to church to come check out my church. And then and we'll share the truth with them. We'll share the hope with them. That, and, and some of them will figure it out. And God will change some lives. But that's it. That's our calling. It's Jesus' mission. Will you help make it happen? Because this is on every single one of us to invite three friends. Now, um, don't let this challenge just kind of bounce off your head. Don't, don't just, don't, don't take it lightly. Because uh, I, I know how this is. I've been in enough church services to know that people go, yep, that's a great idea, and walk out and never think about it again. And I want us to be intentional. I want us to think about it. And here's why. We all know the tragedy that happened in Roseville this week. And uh, brothers and sisters of ours in Christ gave their life to stand for Jesus. It's a tragedy, and it's also a great testimony to their faith and their faithfulness. And, and there's been a lot of conversation on social media, a lot of people who are posting that you stand with them, that you would say, yes, I'm a Christian uh, in that place. And the truth is, only you and God know whether or not you mean that, right? I mean, you can say, you can post all you want, but when that day comes, only you and God really know in your heart what you've already decided to do. Uh, but here's what I do know. It is much easier to say that you would die for Jesus than it is to actually live for Jesus, and today, Jesus is calling you. He's calling you to follow. He's calling you to declare your faith in him. He's calling you to serve him. He's calling you to join his mission. What's your answer going to be? I pray it's yes. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you that you said yes when it came to sacrificing your son for our sins. Thank you that you said yes when it came to changing our lives and, and lifting us up out of the pit and giving us hope and eternal life. And Father, today I pray that wherever we are in whatever season of life that we will say yes to you. That we will hear the voice of your Holy Spirit as he moves in our lives. That we will surrender to him and allow him to, to heal us and equip us and lead us to life. Father, thank you for the way that you have loved us. We just want to love you back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.